Okay, so hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about a very very important neurological emergency that is acute bacterial meningitis. So I've uploaded notes for this topic as well as yesterday's topic on HSV encephalitis on Neuraxis Pro. I put the link in the description so you can access my notes via this app. Okay, so now let's go into the class. So uh, acute bacterial meningitis is an acute purulent infection within the subarachnoid space. So this is the definition of bacterial meningitis. So what is the important causative organisms for acute bacterial meningitis? The most important cause is pneumococcus, that is streptococcus pneumoniae. So 50% of all bacterial pneumonia, a bacterial meningitis is because of streptococcus pneumoniae. So this is a very, very important MCQ. What is the most commonest cause? So what are the factors that increase the risk of pneumococcal meningitis? The most important is a pneumococcal pneumonia. Others are going to be sinusitis, otitis media, diabetes mellitus, post-plenectomy status, chronic alcoholism, hypogammaglobinemia, complement deficiency, and head trauma with Bessler skull fracture or CSF rhinorrhea. Now coming to the second most important cause, that is meningococcus, that is Neisseria meningitidis, 25% of all bacterial meningitis. But remember that now we have a vaccine against meningococcus, which is known as a quadrivalent vaccine, which contains, uh, which confers protection against zero group A, C, W135 and Y. And remember that zero group B is not included in this vaccine. That's an important MCQ question. So most of the causes of meningococcal meningitis these days is because of zero group B. And complement deficiency gives a very high risk to patients for developing meningococcal septicemia and meningococcal meningitis. And meningococcal meningitis occurs as recurring epidemics every 8 to 12 years. Now coming to group B streptococcus. So group B streptococcus or streptococcus A galactiae consists of 15% of all meningitis and it is a classical cause of neonatal meningitis but nowadays it is also an important cause of uh, bacterial meningitis in adult age group also. Next is Listeria monocytogenes. It consists of 10% of all bacterial, uh, bacterial meningitis and is usually acquired by consuming contaminated food like milk and soft cheese. And very very important, you should remember what are the high risk factors for acquiring Listeria meningitis. So, young infants less than 1 month of age, more than 60 years of age, pregnant, uh, pregnant patients and immunocompromised patients. So whenever you are starting empirical uh, antibiotic therapy for a patient with bacterial meningitis, if they fit into any of these risk factors, it's very important that you should add ampicillin. It's very very important that you should add ampicillin to cover listeria. Next coming to Haemophilus influenza type B. So this is a uh, now less common cause. It's in a, currently in a decreasing trend because of routine Haemophilus influenza type B conjugate vaccine. So it consists of less than 10% of all bacterial meningitis. Next is Staphylococcus aureus and coagulase negative Staphylococcus. So these are, uh, this organism is an important cause of meningitis post neurosurgery and it's also associated with meningitis in patients who have a subcutaneous omoyo reservoir for delivery of intrathecal chemotherapy. So this is a omoyo reserve as you can see. Uh, drugs can be uh, directly given into the intrathecal space via this reservoir. Okay. Now coming to gram-negative meningitis. So what are the risk factors for gram-negative meningitis? Diabetes, liver cirrhosis, chronic alcoholism, chronic urinary tract infections and post-head injury or post-neurosurgery. So these are the important causative organisms. Now let's go into the clinical features. So the classical triad in meningitis is going to be fever, headache and neck rigidity and in case you get an MCQ, what is the most common symptom of bacterial meningitis? It's going to be headache. Very, very important MCQ. And more than 75% of the patients are going to present with decreased level of consciousness. And where you should important meningeal signs, very, very important frequently asked question. So you should remember Koenig's sign and Brodsky's sign. Both are elicited when the patient is in the supine position. So in Koenig sign, what you're going to do is the thigh and the knee of the patients are going to be fully flexed. And any attempt to passively extend the knee is going to cause pain. And in Brutskin's sign, passive flexion of the neck is going to cause spontaneous flexion of the hips and knees. So don't forget these two important meningeal signs. Seizures are going to occur in 20 to 40 percent of the patients and raised intracranial pressure okay they can present as decreased consciousness papal edema dilated and poorly reactive pupils false localizing sign causing six nerve palsy decerebrate posturing cushing's reflex which is characterized by bradycardia hypertension and irregular respiration that's an mcq and one to eight percent of the patients are going to die because of cerebral herniation okay 
Next, meningococcal meningitis, the important clinical clue that tells us that meningococcal meningitis is there is the presence of a diffuse petechial rash. Okay, so this is the petechial rash in meningococcal septicemia or meningococcal meningitis. Over here, you can see all the petechiae have become confluent. Okay, so this is a very, very important clinical sign of meningococcal meningitis or septicemia. Alright, now coming to the clinical diagnosis. So, the most important lab investigation is going to be CSF analysis. Analysis. Sorry. So, the question is, do you have to do a CT or MRI brain before going for a lumbar puncture? The uh, answer is no. You do not have to routinely do a neuroimaging before going for a lumbar puncture. But there are certain indications for doing a uh, MRI or CT brain before doing a lumbar puncture. And they are immunocompromised patient, patient who has history of recent head trauma, decreased consciousness and papilledema, which are signs of raised ICT. Signs of raised ICT. And patients are having focal neurological deficits. So, if patient has any of these, you will have to do an MRI or a CT before going for the lumbar puncture. So, what are you going to see in the CSF examination? So, the patient is going to have a raised opening pressure, more than 180 millimeters of water, pleocytosis, around 10 to 10,000 cells per microliter with a predominant neutrophilic pleocytosis. And the glucose, CSF glucose is going to be less. This is known as hypoglycorrhea. But the problem is, the CSF glucose will vary as per the serum glucose. So, you have to look for CSF serum glucose ratio. So, if it is less than 0.4, it's highly suggestive of bacterial meningitis. This is a very, very important MCQ question. Proteins are going to be raised more than 45 milligrams per deciliter. And in more than 60% of the time, you're going to get, uh, you're going to uh, visualize the organism in gram staining. And more than 80% of the time, culture is going to be positive in the CSF. Other uh, special investigations you can do in the CSF, you can go for a polymerase chain reaction that detects bacterial DNA and you can go for latex agglutination. And remember, latex agglutination is highly specific for pneumococcal meningitis and meningococcal meningitis. So, that's a very important question. And limulus lysate. This is the investigation of choice for detecting gram-negative meningitis because this assay is going to detect your gram-negative endotoxin. So, it's going to detect your gram-negative endotoxin. So, it is the investigation of choice in the CSF for detecting gram-negative meningitis and that's an important MCQ. Okay, now coming to neuroimaging. So, if you happen to take an MRA brain along with gadolinium contrast, you're going to see diffuse meningeal enhancement but this is not specific. This can also be seen in chemical meningitis, hypersensitivity meningitis or even carcinomatous meningitis. So, it's not a very uh, specific investigation. And before starting antibiotic therapy, very important, you'll have to take a blood culture. And in case the patient's having meningococcal infection with your petechial rash, you can go ahead and take a biopsy of the petechial skin lesions. Now, coming to treatment. So, it's very important that you have to start antibiotic therapy as soon as possible. So, remember acute bacterial meningitis is a very important medical emergency and antibiotics should be started within 60 minutes. So, only if you are going to start it early, the mortality and the incidence of permanent neurological deficit is going to reduce. Okay, now what are the empirical antibiotics you are going to start? So, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, prudent to uh, understand that you do not have to wait for the CSF reports before starting antibiotics. So, if your clinical diagnosis is of uh, meningitis, you can go ahead and start empirical therapy. But what are the different uh, types of empirical therapy? So, in infants who are less than 3 months of age, you're going to add cefotaxim or ceftrioxone. But remember, as we discussed earlier, less than 3 months of age, they are at high risk of listeria infection. So, you have to add ampicillin. So, less than 3 months of age, along with your cefotaxim or ceftrioxone, you are going to add ampicillin. Next, in case you are having children more than 3 months of age and adults less than 55 years of age who are immunocompetent, immunocompetent and have no other risk factors, you can go, you can give cefotaxim or ceftrioxone or cefepime along with vancomycin. Now, in case you are having an adult who is more than 55 years of age and having alcoholism or other debilitating illness or other comorbid illness, you will have to add ampicillin. Because again, these patients are at risk of listeria meningitis. So, whenever there is a risk factor of listeria, you have to add ampicillin to the 
empirical antibiotic therapy. So along with ampicillin, extra you are going to add your usual cefotaxim or ceftrioxone or cefepime along with vancomycin. Now in case you are having a patient with hospital acquired meningitis, post-traumatic or post-neurosurgery meningitis, very very important question, neutropenic patients and patients who are having impaired cell mediated immunity like in HIV patients. So in these patients you are at high risk of gram negative meningitis. They are at very high risk of gram negative meningitis as well as listeria meningitis. So for listeria you are going to add ampicillin and as usual you are going to add vancomycin. But remember the most important cause of gram negative meningitis is pseudomonas. So you have to give an antibiotic that is anti -pseud which has anti pseudomonal activity like ceftazidime or meropenem. And additionally if you are going to have a patient who has sinusitis, otitis or mastoiditis that is any patient who is having an ENT infection. That time in addition to your usual empirical antibiotic therapy, you are going to add metronidazole to cover anaerobes. So remember in this scenario, you have to add metronidazole to cover your anaerobic organisms if the patient is having any ENT infection. Okay, now coming to the specific antimicrobial therapy. So for meningococcal meningitis, your antibiotic duration is minimum 7 days. And remember penicillin G is the antibiotic of choice, that's an important MCQ. Only if the patient is resistant to penicillin G, you have to go for ceftrioxone or cefotaxin. And unlike other meningitis, you have to give chemoprophylaxis to all the close contacts of the patient. And the drug of choice for chemoprophylaxis is going to be rifampicin. Very, very important MCQ. But if the patient is not tolerating rifampicin or the patient is pregnant where rifampicin is contraindicated, you can try azithromycin or a single intramuscular dose of ceftrioxone. Now coming to pneumococcal meningitis, you are going to give antibiotics for 2 weeks. So you are going to give ceftrioxone or cefotaxin or cefepime along with vancomycin. And in case the patient is not responding to IV vancomycin, you might have to give intraventricular vancomycin. The dose is 20 mg once per day. And intraventricular route is preferred over intrathecal route. Now coming to listeria meningitis, you have to give the antibiotics for 3 weeks. And remember, whenever you think of listeria, the next thing that should come to your mind is ampicillin. Okay, and in case a patient is allergic to ampicillin, you can try cotrimoxazole and in critically ill patients, very important, you have to add an aminoglycoside like gentamicin. Okay, now coming to staphylococcal meningitis. So in sensitive strains, you can go for nafcillin, but in case of MRSA or penicillin allergy, the drug of choice is going to be vancomycin. And just, for pneumoco just like in pneumococcal meningitis, if there is no response to IV vancomycin, you will have to go for 20 mg OD of intraventricular vancomycin. And in gram-negative meningitis, which is usually because of pseudomonas, always give ceftazidime or meropenem along with your usual uh, antibiotic therapy. So if pseudomonas is there, usually it's the cause of pseudomonas, you have to go for ceftazidime or meropenem. Other organisms, you can give cefotaxim, ceftrioxone or ceftazidime. Now coming to adjunctive therapy. So it's very important that you give IV steroids. You have to give IV steroids because this is going to reduce the mortality reduce the brain inflammation and also reduce the incidence of permanent neurological sequelae. So what are the pointers you have to remember before giving steroids? So this is highly effective for pneumococcal meningitis. So maximum benefit is seen in pneumococcal meningitis. Next it's very important that you have to give it before giving antibiotics. Okay, you have to give IV steroids before starting antibiotics, around 20 minutes before giving IV antibiotics. Never give it during or after. Next is IV dexamethasone is going to reduce the CSF penetration of vancomycin. Okay, so these are the important points you have to remember regarding IV steroids. So usually we are going to give IV dexamethasone 10 mg uh, every 6th hour for 4 days. And what are the important cytokines? that play a role in uh, inflammation uh, related to bacterial meningitis. It is tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin 1 beta. These two are important MCQ questions, don't forget. Now coming to the prognosis. So the highest mortality is for pneumococcal meningitis. It's around 20% even if the patient is given treatment. And for listeria meningitis, it is 15% and 3-7% to for H influenza, meningococcus and group B streptococci.
And remember that 25% of the survivors are going to develop neurological sequelae in the form of decreased intellectual function, memory impairment, seizures, hearing loss, very, very important, dizziness and gait disturbances. Okay, so I think I covered most of the important points in acute bacterial meningitis. Thank you.